Okay, everybody, uh, welcome to tonight's talk, Common Sense Natural Beaking with Kim Flottam. Uh, we're very grateful to, that he's agreed to talk to us. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Kim. Where you go? Well, Brendan, thank you. Hello, everybody. It's uh, 2.30 in the afternoon where I am. So um, I'm after lunch and before supper. So it's right in the best part of the day. Uh, today, I want to talk about um, there's a lot of interest in in what what people call natural beekeeping, and then there is as many definitions of natural beekeeping as there are people who do it, I believe. Uh, and and there are some things that when you look at natural beekeeping, you might think of as not at all natural or uh, uh, way too odd to even consider. So what I want to do today is look at some of the aspects of of this and. Uh, figure out how to how to turn my slide. Here we go. The first thing I did was I looked up natural. I looked up the word natural, and 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 in the dictionary, what does natural mean really? Because like I said, it means a lot of things. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So I went to the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary and and and. The definitions they had of natural are not made or caused by people, or growing without human care, no extra substances or chemicals added. And, and, and because of the way the world is lately, the word natural is, is in the top 20% of words used, believe it or not. So, so how does growing without human care, no extra substances or chemicals added, not made or caused by people, with respect to natural, let's look at these aspects of a honeybee's life. Let's look at housing. I want to look at health. I want to talk about food, queens, and protection, and relative to the term natural here. So the other thing that I did when I started putting this together is I talked to Ross Conrad, who wrote the book, Natural Beekeeping. Uh, he was he was a writer for me when I was the editor of Bee Culture Magazine. I've known him for many years, and this was the definition that he gave me. And um, natural beekeeping is used to refer to honeybee stewardship that addresses pest disease and potential starvation issues without relying on synthetic pesticides, antibiotic drugs, or the regular use of an artificial diet. It does not mean minimal hive inspections which would mean honeybee neglect, not natural bee stewardship. So that kind of that, that kind of lays it out pretty well. It's some things that are natural when you're keeping bees and some things that, that you can still do and, st and remain natural. So let's take a look at a couple of these things. I'll figure this program out eventually. Right there is about as natural as you can get. Bees living in a tree, not no interference by humans, a bear may have something to say about it soon enough, but um, <clears throat> nothing added, nothing taken away. Um, this is the natural way that bees live. And if you've looked at, if you've been able, fortunate enough to look at Tom Seeley's newest book, The Lives of Bees, one of the things that you'll see is in how he has studied natural bee, natural tree cavities the size of them, the thickness of the walls, the, where the opening is uh, generally, the propolis envelope that surrounds it, uh, the inside of the nest. And, and you'll, once you see that, you'll be able to see what bees do get left to their own devices. And this is about what it's going to be. It's going to be a cavity in a tree. So. Let's talk about housing. Sometimes you've, you've seen these where a bee or a swarm will leave a hive, it'll land in a tree and it can't make up its mind and it ends up going nowhere. It just lives in the tree with an exposed nest. Of course, the life, lifetime expectancy of this nest is winter. You know, by winter it will be gone or at least winter where I am. Uh, we have snow and frozen lakes and things so, uh, <clears throat> In some parts of the world, this this colony would probably exist quite well, and it'd be a natural it'd be a natural housing. It's not a tree, but it's something that the bees chose, and and um, they made it work. This is this is um, 
not made or caused by people, these hollow trees, but it's not keeping bees either. Uh, one of the things that, that to consider on a tree cavity uh, is, is, like I said, the propolis envelope, the thickness of the walls is, is uh, an insulative value that, that the boxes that we use doesn't even come close to approaching. Some of the some of the thick some of the walls that Tom Seeley looked at had an R value that's resistant value of 11, which is a, the equivalent of 11 inches of wood. Um, R three quarters of an inch of wood in the boxes that we use offers n almost no security at all, and that works both in the winter when they have to keep uh, the the uh, cluster warm, and it works in the summer when they have to keep the inside of the nest cool. So the thicker the wall, the less work they do both winter and summer. And, and, and it's not, you know, what we have to do to accommodate those uh, environmental concerns, that is staying warm or, or staying warm or being able to stay cooler, is we have to add something to those walls. We have to add insulation of some kind. Styrofoam boxes probably uh, are the best that, that we could do, but then it's, caused by people. It's, the, um, it's not, it's not going to be as, as, as you might put it, natural. But when you look at housing, this is the bees, you know, often the bees first choice. But as everybody knows, bees sometimes choose other places uh, when there are no trees, uh, or there is a plethora of inviting locations that they choose, uh, you know, inside the walls of your house, uh, above windows, uh, skeps, the skep was probably the first artificial container, an upside down basket um, was found by bees and it kind of met the, the cavity requirements that they wanted and suddenly there was a beehive in a basket. Surprise, surprise for the person who picked up the basket, but for, for um, uh, bees will we'll find cavities or locations that are approach the same as the the uh, hollow tree. The insulation in my house is going to help if they get between the walls, but it's still not going to be, it's not going to be the size or shape of a cavity. Exposed nests outside um, uh, or underneath the eaves of a house, something like that, uh, are approach, but they certainly aren't uh, as good as a as good as a hollow tree. Now here's something that's sort of a hybrid. This is African Afri uh, having bees in Africa, and and the beekeepers there simply hang hollow logs in the trees, and because African bees swarm so often, that they that log will be occupied, filled with honey, and then left every season, and another swarm will come by and and uh, find it and make a home in it. So sort of a hybrid. It's not as thick. You can see how thick it is. It's thicker than our, our uh, the boxes that we have, but it's not very thick, but then they don't need a lot of insulation. You hang it in the shade and it helps with the heat in the heat of the day. And they, of course, they don't have winter there uh, or a winter like we have. So from a bee's perspective, this isn't a bad way to go. This is approaching approaching natural, but yet still having some input from man. And then of course, what we've done is we've taken that design and, and made it our own uh, with, with uh, top bar hives, with long horizontal hives, with even wary hives are somewhat similar to the, to the uh, somewhat similar to the uh, inside of a tree. Uh, the, <clears throat> The, the um, top bar hive and the horizontal hive, of course, aren't up and down. They are, they are hor horizontal. The combs are side by side. It's just a, a long, long uh, cavity that we put them in. And I'm, I'm not sure how close to natural that approach is. Um, I'd like to say that it's something that beekeepers do because I don't mind horizontal beekeeping at all because it's easier on my back. So this is something I'm doing for me, not for the bees. And, and it's similar to the top bar hive. The wary hive, of course, just gets taller. It doesn't get longer. And that approaches uh, the inside of a, a, a tree cavity. So these are, these are ways that people have looked at that they want to they consider it to being more natural perhaps 
than the boxes that we put bees in. Uh, and in some respects, they kind of are. Um, one of the other things that you'll find out when you read Tom Seeley's book is, is the population dynamics of, of uh, an environment. How many, how many beehives are gonna be in a given area? And what he found in the woods of his, around his home in Ithaca, New York, was about one per square mile. Uh, this is my backyard, and I've got four too many colonies in this backyard. So uh, we have we have not only put them in boxes, we've put way too many boxes close to each other. And this, of course, is going to lead to some drifting. Uh, it's going to lead perhaps to some robbing. It's going to be a challenge to have enough resources in the area to supply all of the food that that all five of these hives are going to need. The same with water. We've really changed the dynamics of, of the population um, environment by doing by putting bees in in uh, apiaries with more than one colony per square mile. And then you take a look at this. And this is a holding yards in Southern California for uh, just before almond pollination. Can you imagine a bee being in one of those, each one of those white specks is four colonies, it's a pallet. And you can see the pallets just disappear into the, into the distance there. Can you imagine a bee flying out looking for food, You're coming back and trying to figure out where home is? This is, this is way not normal, uh, overcrowding. Uh, it's not good. The beekeepers or beekeepers in that area are from all over the U.S. and suddenly everything that's in the U.S. is all over these bees. We share very nicely when we put this many this close together. Everybody has the same thing that everybody else has in terms of pests and diseases and stresses. So this is this is not at all natural. I mean, you have to you have to look at it that way. Well, that's housing, and and if it's not a if it's not a hollow tree trunk, it it and you want to be natural. That's the kind of housing you're going to look to duplicate. You're going to have it insulated. You're going to have it the right size. Uh, we're going to talk about more things about housing in a minute, uh, like uh, how many you know adding supers. When you pick a tree trunk, uh, you don't add supers to it. Um, you don't change the bottom board, you don't change the entrance. Uh, so we're going to look at those things. Next, I want to talk about health and food. And, and when we think of natural, we'll go back to that definition of natural that we had. It was, it was uh, not, at, you know, not, uh, nothing was added. And, and as beekeepers, we generally add things for varroa mites, for American fowl brood, for nosema, for wax moth. Uh, the, the chemicals that, that we that we use to uh, try and fix the things that go wrong with a colony because there are too many colonies too close together because they don't have a, a, a good enough nest because uh, of all of the things that we do that aren't natural for them. But these are chemicals too that we use, sugar syrup, it's a chemical, high fructose corn syrup, pollen supplements, the uh, the foul smelling chemicals that we use for removing honey, um, the stuff that we put in sugar syrup to stimulate feeding behavior, uh, even applying smoke to a hive on a routine basis. Um, the, 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 the bees in California this year have been smoked routinely. Uh, but that, of course, isn't natural. Um, and, and we smoke our bees routinely. Just when you're going to go out and take a look, you lift the cover, you put some snow, smoke in. That's got to be that's got to be a stress and it's got to be a problem uh, that that bees don't like having to deal with. But we do it to them. Um, so the question is, then, which chemical are there any chemicals that are good? Are there are which chemicals are bad? Can we reduce or eliminate the bad chemicals from our operation? Can we reduce or eliminate the good chemicals from our operation? And in the long run, what difference is any of this going to make really um, uh, when it comes to what we do to bees? Are we able to make life better for them and better for us by doing any of these things? I think if you're gonna look at, at, at being as close to natural as you can when it comes to the health of bees, your first and best choice is going to use better bees. Uh, that kind of goes without saying, but but you really need to talk about it. 
uh, what are the best bees? That there, there are the bees that are the survivors. They're the bees that, of those five colonies in my backyard, the one that made it through the winter, that's the one I'm going to look at, or the two that made it through the winter. The three that didn't, too bad, they didn't, you didn't make the first cut. We've got Russian bees here. And those have proven to be fairly reliable when it comes to being resistant to, to varroa and, and very good producers if they're in the right environment. Um, they're, not better, they're not better bees in some parts of our country because they wait so long to build up in the spring. Uh, our honey flows tend to start March, April uh, and May, and the Russians are just beginning to build up by late May. So they've missed the early honey flows. And if that's the only honey flow that you have is the early ones, like much of our South is the honey production season is over in June, the Russians have missed most of it. So they're not better bees for everywhere, but where I am, they're pretty, they're pretty good because they, they, miss, they miss the um, early flow, but then they make up for it later. And we have our biggest flow is midsummer to late summer. Any bees that are resistant to any of the pests that we have are the kind of better bees that you're looking for, whether it doesn't make any difference, the race or, or uh, origin is, if they seem to be out in the backyard year after year after year without, without succumbing to varroa or the diseases or uh, any of the problems and stresses that be, other bees are succumbing to, then that's what you want is resistant bees. Uh, and this is why, this is what makes better bees. They're adapted to your location. Like I said, uh, the bees that are adapted to my location, I've lived in Northeast Ohio, which is, which is where we have winter. The bees that we have adapted, that I have adapted to here, do not do well in the South, in Texas and in Florida and in Arizona and vice versa. The bees that do well there are not gonna do well here. They're resistant to or tolerant to monitor to high levels of common pests and diseases. We talked about that. Having some uh, hygienic behavior is part of, but not all of their adaptive behaviors. Hygienic behavior is good for a lot of, helping with a lot of things. Just having a clean nest, uh, certainly dealing with varroa, certainly dealing with the fall brood, some level of hygienic behavior is in normal populations and you want some of that. Uh, wintering well where you winter. And, and I mentioned that we have snow on the ground here most of the winter, most years. Down south, they don't have any. So the bees down there are, if we bring them up here, they're gonna go, what's this white stuff? And that not, not be able to do as well. Uh, one of the things that, that um, makes a, a successful colony is its ability to react to the resources in their environment. And by that, I mean, Bees that can, bees that can, the, the, the first sign of a honey flow, the queen kicks into action and they start raising a lot of brood or even before the first lines of a honey flow, if they're reacting to the length of the of daylight or the length of night or to some other stimulus in the environment that starts them raising a lot of brood so that when you have uh, your major honey flow, you have your major number of bees to take advantage of it. So that's reacting to the resources in their environment. Productive and easy to work. Um, from a bee's perspective, that probably doesn't do them any good one way or the other. From our perspective, it's certainly, certainly that's what we want. We want bees that make lots of honey and, and that I don't have to wear a ton of armor on every time I go to work with them. So what, what, I, want, what I want is productive and easy to work. That makes better bees for me. From a bee's perspective, I don't think it makes any difference at all. Uh, they have to make enough food, but they don't have to make too much. Um, but the, the biggest part of better bees is are they available? Can you get them? Can you get locally produced bees? And bees that are, you know, all of these things suitable for your environment and, and all of the other things, can you even find them? And that's that is without doubt the biggest problem. There are never enough locally produced bees. We have to bring them in we bring the bees to my part of uh, Ohio, most, not all, but most of them come from Northern California. So that's where they are used to living in Northern California, excluding the fires they're having out there this year, Northern California and Northeast Ohio aren't a bit alike. 
And, and the rest of the bees that come here come from Georgia, Texas, uh, Louisiana maybe, but Georgia and Texas are the two big producers and neither of those places are not like Northern, Northeast Ohio. So getting bees that are adapted to my environment is difficult. And you end up having to produce your own most of the time in terms of selecting for queens that, that uh, produce the bees that do the things that you want them to do. Um, <clears throat> and this is how that gets done. You make tough choices, but good selections. You you become the person who, uh, you become the, the driving force of natural selection. You are the natural selection. You are selecting bees that uh, are going to survive where you are. You, and you, there are lots of ways to do this, is to live and let die, James Bond bees. You don't do anything. I put in, I get 10 queens from Northern California. I put in them in 10 packages or 10 nukes. And next spring, let's see who's alive. And those are the ones that we begin selecting from. We select from those, the next spring, who's alive? We keep selecting until we get bees that do fairly well. You can speed that up a little bit. You can live and let die, but help some. And that's practicing good integrated pest management without chemicals. That's just, just management things that you're doing. You're not, you're not adding things to the bees uh, world. You're just modifying things to the in the bees world. And we'll look at that in a minute. Um, so you can live and let die, but help some and then live and let die. So you've added, you've changed, you've made better some things, some parts of their life. And then you see who's who's gonna uh, be there next spring. And, and Varroa, of course, is the thing that we have the biggest problems with. And the honeybees fat body eating uh, demon from hell, and there's no doubt about it. We had we had uh, the researchers from the USDA who did the fat body work on our podcast earlier this year, and and uh, uh, he's now working on tropolalaps, and we're going to talk about that in a minute also. But this is the this is everything comes in second after varroa in terms of our world of, of bee problems. So, what do you do? Um, you, you know, like I said, <clears throat> you can live and let die or you can help out a little or help out a lot. Uh, it depends on your goals and how much you want your bees to adapt to you as opposed to you adapting to your bees. When it comes to raw, you got to know if you're going to do anything at all, you got to know how many you have. And of course, sampling for Varroa, uh, the alcohol wash, they've got that fancy container now that works really well. Uh, you take 300 bees, you soak them in alcohol, you shake the container for a while and then you pour out the alcohol and the mites and you count you count the mites that you have and 300 to half a cup of bees is 300. You count the, the uh, number of bees you have for the number of mites you have for 300 bees and figure out some sort of level and what's the local level. And right now in Northeast Ohio, one is allowed. More than that, and, you, and the recommendation is that you do something to reduce the population growth of the mites in your colony. And, and one is kind of hard to find, if you think about it. Um, and if you do this on a routine basis, then, then you already know that once you do this, the first time you do this, you, you put in um, a half a cup of alcohol and a half a cup of bees and you slosh them around for, and, and what the experts tell me and what I found to be fairly acceptable is four minutes. And, and you're fairly rigorous with this. You're not smashing bees into pieces, but you're, you're shaking them quite well because those mites can insert themselves between segments on those bees and almost disappear. So you've got to be, you know, you've got to, um, do some work to get them out of there. And then once you pour that alcohol out and you count the mites, and then if you're still new at this, then we certainly recommend that you do it again with the same bees, another half a cup of alcohol. You shake them for four minutes and see what happens. And, and what you may do is, what you may find is another couple of mites. So know that uh, if you're testing for mites and you need to know fairly precise numbers of mites for 300 bees that you may want to do this a couple of three times to make sure that you know the population of mites in your colony. And then once you know that population, you can react on whatever the local 
uh, the local tricks are for, for dealing with mice. So detecting and measuring Varroa, make sure you get an accurate measure. But you can do it, you can do it without chemicals. And, and we talked about resistant stocks. Russian bees are fairly impervious to, to uh, mice. They've got uh, varroa sensitive hygienic behavior and, and they remove mites as fast as they find them. They're pretty good at that. We don't have much, we don't have much problems with, with um, varroa on Russian bees. So that's using resistant stocks. You can use uh, non-chemical integrated pest management techniques uh, and drone trapping is very, very helpful. It's not the only thing you probably will wanna do, but it's certainly not going to uh, affect the bees too much by removing drone brood that, that has been capped and has varroa under it. I'll tell you one thing that, that works the best that I've found, and this is how I deal with Varroa, is making midsummer splits right in the middle of a honey flow. It breaks up my honey flow every summer. But what I'll tell you what it does is it, it makes life real miserable for, for the Varroa because I don't, I don't requeen either of the splits right away. I, I leave the original queen in the original colony, but I cage her. And in the new colony, um, I let raise their own. And, and that length of time is going to make it long enough that the varroa that are on, in cells uh, will have emerged. And, and then you can do something. You've got a vulnerable varroa mite who's exposed and not able to be in the cell. And you've got, you've got mites that are just naturally fall off and die. And, and, and they've, got no more, they've got no place to reproduce. So a midsummer split is the best varroa control I can I can tell you is, and it's not all that it's not all that unnatural because if you look at it another way, that colony essentially swarms, and and you've made it think that it's swarmed. It's going to build a new, it's going to produce a new queen. Both colonies will produce new queens, and one of the things you're going to find out with triple A labs um, is that. This is the word triple elaps uh, mites are common. This is how you control them. It's, you, it's called a walk away split. And, and it, it's because triple elaps, when they emerge from a cell, they're only, they, they're only exposed on bees for two or three days. And, and then they have to have another cell to go in. And if you don't have a laying queen, then you don't have, you don't have any way for tropal elaps to reproduce in, and they go away. This is a very, very successful technique for working with them. Not the only one, and may not, may not, you may not want to follow it, but if you run into tropal elaps, know that a midsummer split is really going to be a good way to do this. You can use screen bottom boards, and, and that's when mites fall off, and they fall through the screen, and they end up on the ground below and get consumed by some creature down there. Uh, it's not at all a natural nest once you do this, um, but in the summer, it's not, not uh, terribly disruptive. Uh, you certainly have to put them back in later on, and so they're good for a while, but um, not, 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 not as great as these other things. Uh, I mentioned drone trapping, <clears throat> and, and this is how, this is my drone trapping technique. I put in a frame with uh, no foundation, and, and bees, a, a bee colony wants to produce a lot of drones in the summer, way more than, than they're able to when we use standard foundation um, that produces workers. They want, they want something like 20% of their population, maybe not quite that much, but something like between 15 and 20% of their population to be drones. So when I give them a place to put drone comb, they're going to use it and they will produce a lot of drones. And because they have a longer um, uh, life cycle than workers, Varroa are attracted to drone, um, drone larva because they're going to be a, have a couple, three days more to raise one more, maybe two more offspring. So instead of just one in a worker cell, they can raise two, maybe three in a drone cell. And of course, reproductive success is what makes life go on. So if if I'm gonna if I'm gonna um, create a greater population, I'm gonna try and find it uh, uh, by looking for drone 
their own brood. And the more you give them, the more that that uh, you can capture. I put in, I put in, I use eight frame equipment. Ten, uh, eight, eight, eight. Let me start over. I use eight frame equipment, and I use three uh, medium boxes in my uh, as my brood nest. This is how uh, I'm an old man, and and ten frame deeps are heavier than I care to deal with anymore. So what I do when I do this drone comb um, is I put I put uh, an empty frame in position two, and then a week later on the bottom box, and then a week later a, an empty frame in position seven in the bottom box, and a week later an uh, uh, empty frame in position two in the middle box. The next week I take out the one that I put in. It's been three weeks now. Oh, no, then I wait a week. And then I'll take out the first frame that I put in because it'll be mostly cap. And then every week I just keep I just keep you know replacing or removing one frame um, until they quit raising drones. Uh, my chickens have learned that when I walk out to my bee yard, lunch is coming, and and they are up against they I have them in a pen and they are up against the edge of that pen just waiting for me to walk by because they know that supper is going to be ready and and it takes them. It takes them almost no time at all to consume that entire piece of comb, wax, cappings, larva, mites, everything. I come back in 15 minutes and it's completely gone. So I, it helps my helps my chickens and, and it gets rid of a lot of mites, not all of the mites, but I, it helps my chickens and it gets rid of my mites. So is this natural? Uh, actually, probably more than you might suspect, because you're giving the bees opportunity to raise as many drones as they want. Of course, those drones don't live to maturity, but at least you've 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 uh, satisfied that need to to produce 20% of their population and drones at the height of the season that they want. Then there's soft residue or there's soft chemicals and and. These are the essential oils, APLIFR, APLGARD. Are these natural products? Are these something that we're applying to the to the nest? Yes, it is. And and if you're going to go towards the Merriam-Webster definition of natural, you have now left that definition by putting in these chemicals. And not only that, but you're going to leave not a lot, but some residues of these chemicals in the wax for the next generation to have to live through. So um, it's as easy on bees as you can get by, by when you add these chemicals. If you're going to add a chemical, this is about the least stressful for bees. And, and um, that's that's going to help. And if you're in the live and let die, but help a little, this is um, probably as little as you can you you're going to want to do um, to help a little, and then live and let, let live and let die. Uh, what about the organic acids, formic and 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 oxalic and hopgard? Um, I have to be honest. Anything that I have to do to wear a gas mask to it just the word natural just went out the door on any of these. Um, and and I have used these because I want to know how to I wanted to know how to how how to do them, how to apply them and how uh, well they work if they're applied correctly at the right time. So I've used these enough to know that I don't like them at all, but they are effective. And and uh, um, but because I have to wear a mask and because I have to have a battery out in the bee yard, I, I learned how to do it, and then I went back to I went back to drone trapping and summer splits because to me those are safer for the bees and the beekeeper. The beekeeper is the one that I was worried about here. So are the are the organic acids natural? I I, I hesitate to say they're even close. And then you get the hard the hard stuff. Um, we have in this country a significant problem with contaminated beeswax. There is, as near as we've been able to tell, the company that I worked for when I was working for the magazine is the AI Root Company, and, and we are now primarily candle producers and primarily uh, liturgical candles. Uh, and and those are 51% beeswax. So we have to deal with a lot of, we had to deal with a lot of beeswax. 
And when these chemicals first started coming out, we started testing for them. And we cannot find beeswax produced in this country in any amounts, any, any, any commercial amounts that has not some level of contamination of any or all of these compounds plus other compounds. There's more yet to come. I'll tell you, we'll talk about those in a minute. But, but there is no, know that there is no, when I'm talking to people here in the States and, and you're talking about foundation, know that there is no clean foundation. It's only parts per million of, of whatever it is that you're looking at. But, but I use the analogy, I say, yes, there's hardly any, but would you put your child to bed at night and cover them with a blanket that you knew was only parts per million poison? And and I, I couldn't do that. And as a result, I can't use beeswax. I, I can't use beeswax foundation. I use my, my um, uh, procedure is to use plastic foundation that I put wax on and it's wax that I've collected from my bees. So I know it hasn't got poison in it, but like I said, it's two cups a season. That's all I need, but it's only two cups a season. There isn't enough there to keep a candle maker in business. So the problem with pesticides, the first problem with pesticides is contaminated beeswax and that contamination lives through several generations of other beehives um, as it goes along. So this is, the least natural thing that you can do. Now, if it keeps your bees alive and it keeps you in business, is least natural a bad thing? And, and there's a lot of people that don't think so because this is how I put food on my table, is I keep my bees alive. So those are the those are the, the two sides of the of the balance that you have to look at, which is more important, uh, natural or staying in business and feeding my family. So uh, those are the kinds of decisions to make. American fob root, of course, is the, the second worst problem. It's a spore-forming bacteria. And, and in the States, we have three treatments. We can burn. We can allow wax moth to consume the wax part of, of the, uh, of the uh, hive that, that you keep. Or you can use antibiotics. And in, in the US, we've just passed a law that says I have to go to a veterinarian and get a prescription for an antibiotic of any of the antibiotics that are used with bees and humans. Uh, and we have several. Um, and, and antibiotics is, you know, it's like putting poison in your hive, in my opinion. Uh, burning is, is, in my opinion, the only acceptable treatment for, for American fowl brood. Now, you don't have to often burn everything. You can burn just the frames and scorch the insides of the boxes, or you can burn, you know, and and, and that way you don't take a financial, as big a financial hit as destroying the entire box and having to repair it. But on the other hand, not not completely destroying it is there's always the issues of any residue left behind that you're going to have to deal with next year, or next week, whenever the spores emerge. So. Um, this is my choice. I have, knocking on wood here, I have been fortunate in 40 years of keeping bees to have never had American fowl brood. I've been lucky, but um, if I ever had it, this is what I would do. And I've worked with um, uh, or organizations that have bee yards in, in our groups, and we've had um, American fowl brood there, and this was the choice that we made, is um, uh, get rid of the equipment, get it out of your get it out of the area, get it out, <clears throat> get it, get rid of it and make it such that no other bees can, can um, find and, and use it. I forgot to ask Brandon, if you have small hive beetle and I, I don't know, we have it here. And it is, it is, if you have it, then you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, don't get it. No, it's we don't really, have it. You don't, oh, well, then don't get it. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> it's a, you can see how big it is. It's it's uh, the larvae consume honey, pollen, dead bees, wax. They're just ugly, and and um, what we can do with them is trap them. We don't have to put any chemical on a hive. Uh, we can trap them, and some people are putting um, um, nematodes around the outside of their hive because the life cycle is that the beetle, when it's ready to pupate crawls outside the hive burrows into the ground and then the nematodes will get the larva of the beetle. Um, but uh, since you don't have it, uh, 
my recommendation is don't get it because you don't want it. It's not uh, not a pretty pest. It's worse in the south than it is in the north. I saw my first one here this year about two weeks ago, whereas in the south they have them all year round. So um, we, we don't have them much. Now know this though, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, they, they, they will fly up to 10 miles, or at least 10 miles that we know of, to find a, a beehive to inhabit. So if somebody in your county gets them or you come that close to somebody, know that, that they will travel a long ways to find, a, find your what used to be nice beehive. Wax moth, troublesome, uh, common, but not terribly difficult to control. Uh, and and this is what you need, light and air. Um, and that's all you need. You will not have a wax moth problem if you store your equipment where light and air can get it. <coughs> we just had Sertan re-registered in the United States for use with, with wax moth and, and wax. Sertan is of course a bacteria that attacks the larva and people use it in gardens, the same bacteria use it in gardens and, and you know, for, for organic pest control. So if you're gonna use um, something for this, light and air is your first choice, but Sertan certainly isn't a bad choice. It, all it does is protect the equipment. It doesn't alter the equipment, doesn't contaminate, it doesn't bother the bees. The only thing it bothers is the wax moth larva. So if you can, if you have, um, equipment to store and, and are worried about it, then like I said, light and air, that's all you need. And here's the other things that we run into. What else are bees eating that is not natural? And there they are. There's the agricultural, the agricultural um, pesticides, fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides. Um, and, and we cannot escape those. I can't escape those where I am. I am surrounded by corn and soybeans. And I live in the country and I'm surrounded by corn and soybeans. And most of what my bees have to forage on uh, is in, in roadside ditches and occasionally a field that isn't being used. Um, but, but if you've got, if you're in the central part of the US, pretty much all you've got is soybeans and bees like soybeans. Um, if you've got, if, if you've got around corn, bee in the fall, in the late summer, bees are going to visit corn if there's nothing available. Um, canola is another popular crop that that has trouble with with uh, pesticides and bees. So, uh, no matter you could be the most natural beekeeper in the world and never do anything at all, and your bees are going to fly out and run into some of this. And and you know you can try and find a location that avoids this to some degree, but you're not going to get rid of it completely. So. Um, and they're going to bring it back to the colony and they're going to store it um, in, you know, the, in the pollen or the nectar and, and that poison is going to remain and that poison is just like the poison that we put in for, for varroa, it's going to be absorbed into the wax and, and agricultural chemicals are, when we were testing wax for making candles, we found more agricultural chemicals, a higher concentration of agricultural chemicals than we did in varroa control chemicals. So no matter what you do, think of that putting your child to bed at night and, and um, covering them with a blanket that's only part per million poison. And, and you'll know why we're having the troubles that we're having. You have to have water, of course, and that goes without saying where they get it, whether you put it in a pail uh, or a bird feeder or someplace in the bee yard, or they've got a pond up back. Um, but water need they need water and they're going to drink on a hot day they're going to drink a gallon of water they're going to they use it to cool their nest and just because they're thirsty so uh providing water is necessary for a healthy colony make sure that the water that's provided is as clean as you can find uh <clears throat> one of the definitions of natural was uh no extra food applied but um when you're starting a colony or you've had um a, uh, if you're living like the beekeepers in California, there is nothing to eat in Northern California, Oregon, or parts of Oregon and Washington this year. There's nothing but ash out there. So uh, providing uh, bees is not only necessary, but it, it, it is, is required for the health of the colony. They're going to starve without it. And, and is, is, is 
the fire are the fires we're having here caused by the drought that they're having caused by climate change and you can get in an argument real fast if you want to do that but but there are a lot of people who are who are saying that climate change is part of what's driving that and a lot of other things going on in the bees world um so so if you have to feed, what are you going to feed? And of course, real food is what you're going to, what you should be feeding. You should be, I, I hope everybody listening has a pollen trap and uses it every year. Um, you either can use it and trap pollen and sell to people, or you can use it and trap pollen and feed back to your bees. Either one, it's the best free food you can get. And, and why more beekeepers don't do this is just beyond me. Um, everybody should be trapping pollen all of the time but but we don't but this may be may be enough uh impetus to do so is trap real pollen and if you're going to feed carbohydrates you've you've got honey to feed them you've got frames of honey stored frozen something somewhere in boxes that you can put on a colony that can't get honey anywhere else it has to have honey um if you're going to feed feed natural food when you're looking at what what's in nectar uh primarily sucrose sugar and water and which breaks down into fructose glucose uh water has to be reduced to less than 17 percent or for, for ferment and then all of the minerals that are in there calcium and copper and potassium and manganese and magnesium and sodium and and all the rest um you don't get any of those in sugar syrup you don't get any of those in high fructose corn syrup. Uh, you, this is why nectar is the natural food is what if you want to feed, this is what you're feeding besides carbohydrates. So if you're going to feed bees that, that can't get food any other way, then you, what you want to be able to do is give them as much of the natural food in their diets as you can. Um, like I said, sugar, high fructose fondant, corn syrup fondant, definitely not honey. Um, you can put honey be healthy in a stimulant that makes bees think they're hungry and that'll make them eat sugar and high fructose corn syrup and fondant, but it's again, it's not natural food. One of the things to consider um, about, about uh, honey be healthy, it's, it's, you know, it's just a collection of essential oils and, and it's, it's a flavoring, but it is a feeding stimulant. And, and, and the, the, the products that it's made from, you can find in the environment almost anywhere. So if you're having an issue with nosema, when uh, bees go off feed, that's the main problem is they go off feed. This can help if you can get, if you can get them to make, if you can make them think that they're hungry. And, and it's an, uh, close to natural stimulant as you can get but it's still a stimulant. And pollen, natural pollen, fats, sterols, cholesterol, lipids, phospholipids, vitamin B complex A, K for hypopharyngeal gland development, the minerals, you can read the minerals that are there, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, sodium, calcium, sodium chloride. Between 55 and 120 pounds a year is what a colony is gonna collect. And, and, and it, of that that they collect, between 10 and 40%, uh, the, the crude protein in what they collect is between 10 and 40%. So of course, the more 40% they collect, the less they have to collect, but, but it's the proteins in their diet and this is the only place that they can get it. So if you have to feed because of whatever reason and you, you, are, you are okay with feeding your bees because they weren't able to collect, then that pollen you collected all last summer and threw in the freezer and saved all winter is the best that you can do. No doubt about it. Um, the, carbo, the, the, the protein supplements are, are just that, they're supplements. They've got the right amounts of protein in them in kind of the same concentrations and uh, as, as pollen does, but they're, it's stuff that they've come out of the test tube and they mix it with high fructose corn syrup and they feed it to bees and it, it gets them by, but it certainly isn't the best that they can do. So again, get a pollen trap this year and use it next year and, and, and have it ready so that you can feed your bees pollen. 
Um, one of the things when you've got one queen or one colony per square mile, like Tom Seeley did, is is the the genetic makeup of the entire region, and and depending on depending on a lot of things really, but but depending on um, how many colonies. Uh, you really find out in that square mile, it's going to de determine the de genetic diversity of the queens that are produced when a colony swarms. And, and the virgin queen goes out to mate. Where is she going to, where is she going to find drones? The drones that she's going to find, are they related to them? And one of the pro biggest problems that we have is a lack of genetic diversity in our queens is because we have so many bees in the places that can support bees. Uh, you can bring you can bring in genetic diversity. You are artificially rearranging the genes in that area, um, but that's the only way that you can do it. In in the Georgia, Florida, Texas, Northern California regions, that's what they have to do to get genetic diversity is to bring in queens from bring in genes from someplace else. So then then you run into the issue of bees adapted to your location and and trying to figure out that in the formula is I want bees adapted to my location but I also need enough diversity so that uh, my bees don't start to be all the same and not you know all susceptible to the same diseases all not doing being able to winter well all of those things um, so it's a, it's a balance and if you're raising your own queens where you are then that's the balance you want to look at. And on, on occasion, if you have the live and let die, and and and, and um, that's all that you have when you're selecting for queens, then then occasionally you're going to want to get something new in there to uh, make it better, different. I guess is the way I would look at it. So you need good genetic diversity, but you need bees that are adapted to your location, and it's a it's a it's a balance that's, that's kind of hard to reach. Uh, <clears throat> you, you all know about the queen. Uh, your colony will cease to exist if they're not a queen or a means to produce one. So if you lose a queen, you have to have eggs so that the, the workers in the colony can select several of those eggs. Uh, the one day old larva when they hatch and begin to raise queen cells from them and you need several. Uh, the queen that died um, mated with several drones in her lifetime and the eggs that she produces are going to be uh, uh, different genetics and you want a lot of you want a lot of uh, diversity in that and that group of cells that are going to be produced. The greater the diversity, the better the chance that the queen that finally is chosen is going to be the best adapted uh, for that area. Um, and and there's something that goes on a little bit with with um, uh, the workers that are taking care of the queen cells, knowing sisters from half sisters. So there's some of that there also, but. If uh, if you need if you need to raise a queen, what you want is a lot of cells, and and you know the life cycle. Um, queens here uh, start as a fertilized egg, and you can see uh, under normal circumstances a queen's going to live two to five years, and 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 in a natural colony that's probably on the long side, and in our colonies I know it's on the long side. If I said nine months, a queen is going to live. Any of the queens that we get anymore, I'm I'm close to being right. A year is is a good queen anymore. It used to be two to five, and I'd like it to be two to five. But anymore, it's going to be a, a year or less. And and I'm guessing it's probably close to that where you are. Um, with all of the issues that we just talked about, with with wax and uh, the uh, the the pesticides that bees run, <coughs> the pesticides that bees run into, um, the stresses in the colony with food shortages and not good selections of food, a year is a good time for a queen. More than a year, and 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 you're doing really well. Um, what does she do? She lays eggs. She has to be able to have enough food and enough. Uh, workers to take care of those eggs to continue the uh, the um, 
colony, where do you get queens? Like I said, ours come from either Northern California or Georgia, and I'm in Northeast Ohio. Some are in Northeast Ohio, but primarily, primarily the queen production areas in 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 uh, those two places in the U.S. So, again, our what is the diversity of the queens in Northern California, and will that diversity do well in Northeast Ohio? Um, it's a crapshoot. Is what it is, and and sometimes you get lucky, and most of the time you get an average queen that comes out and is gone in nine months after you put her in. So so there's a lot of emphasis. There's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people want to be able to produce queens locally, and and you know can you do that locally? A few maybe, but not enough certainly to supply all of the beekeepers here, and that's our biggest problem. Um, when the bees make their own, like I said earlier, you want enough bees in a colony uh, so that there's a lot of selection. There can be a lot of selection so there can be as many cells produced as possible so that the best cell uh, will produce the best queen, one hopes. And, and uh, an emergency, emergency uh, queen, often you don't have as many um, cells and, and a supersedure often you don't have as many cells as you would like to have. So, so if you can supply, if you know that a colony has gone queenless, one of the things you may want to do is supply them with some frames with that do have eggs in them, so that they can start with enough um, <clears throat> with a, with enough selection. And what about swarming? The the colonies that that uh, Tom Seeley studied in in his study in, in Ithaca, New York. Um, Every colony essentially swarmed every year, and and 90% of those swarms did not make it through the winter, but 10% did. So so the other the other half of that equation is 10 about 10% of the colonies that produced a swarm this year did not make it through winter. So the population of colonies re, was remained relatively stable. <clears throat> what kept changing a lot was the genetic diversity in the colonies, the one that was that had been around for a while uh, would last two or three years and then it would it would you know die from something. Um, but it, in that two or three years it had produced two or three swarms. And and um, so then so then you can you continue feeding the diversity, the diversification of the of the environment that the that the bees are in. But swarming is is as natural as you can get, and and not letting bees swarm um, is as unnatural as you can get. What we do to colonies that we don't let them swarm um, uh, goes against the grain of everything that that they're they're programmed to do. Of course, they bees will make as much honey as they have room for. Um, unlike pollen. They'll, they'll store enough pollen to feed the population that's going to be in a little bit. They're, they're looking at the at the population growth, and they're going to collect a lot of uh, pollen early in the season, and then it tapers off. But they'll collect as much honey as they have room for. And of course, we've taken advantage of that by taking most of their honey. So taking their honey from them is they actually don't. I'm I'm anthropomorphizing here. Uh, removing their their surplus honey actually just gives them room to put more honey in, and what they want to do is make honey. So we've kind of uh, scratched that itch for them, uh, and and let them give given them that opportunity to keep producing honey. But pollen they won't do. Um, so harvesting honey probably doesn't do damage, but it's certainly not something that's going to happen in that hollow tree. Uh, we talked about wax. And and the, uh, how much the contaminants that we're finding in it, uh, I I kind of worry about burning a beeswax candle anymore because of what it's releasing and what some of the things that uh, the people that are doing the testing have said. Yes, there's stuff in here that you don't want to be breathing um, on a regular basis. So. Um, <clears throat> making taking wax and making candles not only taking wax but but from a harvest that that may or may not be okay but making candles from it and burning them is changing my natural environment now so i'm going to probably back off from doing that 
we started talking about protection and you can see the makeup of, of a colony and a tree there. Uh, the yellow is the honey, the white is the wax, the brown is the brood. Uh, like I said, the tree trunk can be up to R11, uh, protecting it in the winter, helping it, helping the bees be able to stay warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. If we're going to do that, we have to add something. And there again, it's not natural. We're adding something. You add insulation. You add, you know, put around the box. Uh, you reduce the size of the of the entrance. You put in uh, insulated top on it to keep it from um, all of the moisture. When you look at the inside of that tree, what you've got is you've got a wall with a ceiling, and so any moisture that that goes up there has nowhere to go. But what you find in in a natural nest like this is that the, the bees will be closer to the top than the bottom because the entrance that they've chosen is usually a, a close to the bottom. So the warm air is going to stay up there, but it's not going to be cold and condensed. Where it will condense is down near the opening uh, on the walls around the opening because that's where it's going to be the coolest. And that's where the bees get their water for winter. It's off the walls because of the propolis envelope that they've put in that cavity. And, and the water can't sis, uh, sink into the wood and it's collected on the propolis uh, envelope and the bees can use the water that's down by the door, not dripping up on them from above. Um, so what we're doing here by putting insulation on a, on a, on a colony, um, we shouldn't be doing that. And there's lots of ways we can do that. We are beginning to, uh, in the States, beginning to do a lot of, a lot of commercial people are beginning to winter indoors. Uh, that's not new, but it's new on a big scale. Thousands of colonies in a building and you control the CO2 and you control the light and you control the temperature and the, and, and the photo period and all of those things. And, and you get bees that do quite well over winter. The problem you run into is that you have to change that back and, and allow them to begin raising brood or when you take them out of those houses, there's essentially no brood because it's been winter for them the whole time. Um, you can, you can uh, do that, you get temperature control, those buildings will get hot, absolutely hot if you don't, uh, aren't ventilating them all of the time. And in fact, requiring some require refrigeration, but wintering indoors is becoming more common and, and uh, an acceptable way for commercial people to do it. I, of course, don't have a building and fans and CO2 generators and all of those things. Um, so it isn't gonna be acceptable for me other than just storing them inside out of the wind and, and uh, unheated and all of those things. How much food? One of the things that we look at here, uh, if you're gonna go into winter and, and, and you've not had a good summer, uh, the colonies that we have, uh, an entire colony has two deep supers, honey, bees, frames, and boxes should be between 165 and 180 pounds. And you use a scale like this to, to weigh, you weigh the front, you weigh the back, you add the two numbers together and it should come between 165 and 180. If it's less, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna check for food. And, and if it's less, it's because the bees didn't gather enough and do you live and let die or you took too much. Uh, either way, um, if you want that colony to be there next spring, you're going to want to get some food into them. And of course, you've saved your honey and you saved your pollen, so that's what you're going to be feeding them. Um, you're feeding carbs, sugar syrup, awful stuff, high fructose corn stuff, awful stuff. Uh, if frames of honey, you know, that you harvested earlier and kept in a freezer or uh, are able to get from another colony that's got more than it needs. If you're going to feed, if you're going to feed them uh, carbohydrates, you want to feed them honey, and if you're going to feed them protein, you're going to want to feed them the pollen that you've been trapping all summer, um, rather than this uh, pollen substitute. Um, this is just a quick test on when a colony dies and you find it after after uh, the winter. The, the frame up in the top uh, ran out of food, pure and simple. There just wasn't enough food. The frame on the bottom didn't have enough bees. They had enough food, but they didn't have enough bees to be able to get from where they were in that little center cluster over to the left or the right to get to the honey there. 
And, and both of those from a management perspective should not have occurred. But from a natural, natural perspective, this is what happens. This is bees don't collect enough food and they starve or they don't collect, they aren't productive enough. They don't have a good enough queen to produ produce a population that's big enough. And, and there's not enough bees to make it through this. So these are two actually natural ways for a colony to die. Um, I think my time is about up and I think I'm out of slides. So I wanna thank you for, for sticking around and listening and I'm not sure how you handle questions. So we have a bunch of questions. In fact, <laughs> I see there's 17 of them at the moment. There's got a bit of overlap. Um, so the first one is, uh, do you use uh, uh, poly hives at all? Do I, I'm sorry, do I use what? Poly hives. In other words, made from polystyrene, the high density polystyrene hives. Oh, yeah, some people, it, they, I've used them and I like them um, because of all of the things that we talked about, insulation of, of the walls and, and you know, using plastic in a beehive just is like using plastic anywhere isn't natural, but it's as good as I can get and keep my bees alive without having to cut down a tree. Yep. Um, also, so there's a question about water getting in, sitting on the runners, and there's another question similar, how to reduce condensation in the hives. Any suggestions? Well, if you're, if you're using the standard Langstroff hives like we have, the hive that you're looking at at the picture of right now, um, what you want is you want, believe it or not, you don't want any ventilation at all on top. You, you, want, you want the warm air to rise and stay there and stay warm. What you want is the cool air to be down below by the entrance. And you're gonna have to insulate the heck out of the top of that hive to, to, so that it doesn't rise up and condense. And it can be done. Uh, we, do, we were very successful with doing it in Wisconsin when I was working there. But we had R10 insulation on, on the hives and we had four, was it four or eight in? Four, two four inch uh, fiber foam insulation boards on top. Um, so that the top, in fact, the colonies that we overwintered in Wisconsin seldom made clusters. They, it was warm enough in those hives that they were able to be out and about. Of course, they ate a lot more food, but um, they didn't freeze either. So it's, it's purely insulation. Okay. Um so uh, uh, there was another one then about uh, beeswax, contaminated beeswax, the suggestion that it perhaps affects drone fertility. Um, and there's a lot of issues around failing queens here, just like there is, as you, as yeah. you mentioned. So just wonder, uh, is there any connection or any, uh, do you have any idea if there is a connection? Uh, when you look at the cocktail of chemicals that you find when you look at beeswax in this country, um, I'm surprised that bees live at all in a hive. It's, it's, there, there were samples that we tested that had seven or eight different agricultural pesticides in them and three or four varroa control pesticides in the same sample of wax. And the wax that we sampled, we took out of the brood nest. Okay, so it is likely to have an effect. Yep. Um, I, I don't know what chemical does what, but um, I'll go back to covering your kid with a blanket at night. It's only parts per million poison. Okay. Um, and then there's a, 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 a comment on your uh, 10 rules for modern beeking, beekeeping got, got this person hooked. So they, they liked your, your uh, YouTube thing on, on 10 rules for modern beekeeping. Oh, good. Um, okay. Uh, um, and so another question about queens, um, just uh, views on them. They found that they, uh, recent queens haven't functioned well and possibly we haven't given them what they needed, for example, splits, raising in nukes and so on. I suppose, many comments on that, on queens generally? Uh, <clears throat> queens generally are a problem. That's probably a good way of looking at it. They don't live as long as they used to. Um, they and, and and one of the one of the issue, one of the other issues that that is 
beginning to show up is that there is so much selection going on for varroa resistance that some of the other traits are getting abandoned. Um, I, I, you know, they've got the mite biters and and the hygienic bees, and they've got they've got several techniques that they've been able to select for that help reduce the varroa population in a colony. Um, but what are they leaving on the table when they pick those up? And and that's one of the things that they're looking at now. Some of them are, but yep. varroa because of varroa, you know, selecting for varroa resistance is at the front of the wagon in terms of what I want. Um, okay. Um, uh, who do you raise as a good bee beekeeper in the USA that we may have heard about in Europe? Apart from your good well, there, there's a lot, depending on how you want to define good. Um, um, what's the name? In Vermont. Oh, Michael, Michael Young, my, not Michael Young. Michael, um, what's his uh, name in Vermont? Oh, I'll yeah. think. I'll think of it. He's he's Mike he's Palmer. not natural. It's Mike Palmer. Correct. Mike Palmer. Thank you. He's certainly not a hundred percent natural, but he's a lot more than a lot of people there are, and he's being successful. Um, he's quite good at it. Um, if you want to look at just size, you could look at, at uh, the 80 operation, you know, they're running close to 100,000 colonies. They lose a lot every year, but they still make more money and more honey than you can possibly imagine. Uh, the Miller operation in Idaho and California does a pretty good job. Um, and they are, they, they, they are to the point where they're not even making honey anymore, or hardly any honey, because what they're trying to do is the, the biggest market for bee products in this country right now is bees um, because they're so hard to keep alive. So uh, some of the commercial people have just abandoned honey production because you can't compete with imported honey at you know 75 cents a pound when it costs you $2, $2.50 a pound to make. But I can sell bees for 30 bucks a pound. And, and so I'm gonna, there, a lot of people are beginning to put their energy in that direction rather than making a lot of honey. So th those people you don't see because they'll just produce a lot of bees and they'll, they'll get those bees to the people who are producing packages or nukes. And, and those are the people that you see. And, and uh, <clears throat> the, the, the queen producer in California, um, yeah. My head isn't working today. The one, the big one, the biggest one in California um, uh, is doing a good job, but he's getting bees from some of these other people who are just producing bees. He's producing the queens, so the genetics are what he wants. He just needs the carriers and to get to the, his customers. Okay. Um, next one. Uh, what? Have, how have you treated your bees this year, or what have you treated them with, or not? Well, uh, like I said, I used drone trapping and summer splits. And this year I, I, I wanted to try something because I haven't done it before. And I have to be able to say how it works when, when I'm sitting here and you're asking me questions. <laughs> but I tried Formic Pro this year uh, on some, and I, I wanted to see how well I you know tested, tested my bees a lot. So I know the, the mite population, it was low this year, uh, but I knew the mite population and I am right in the middle of the treatment right now. So I'll be able to look in another week to see how well it did. I know what the mite population was before and then I'll be able to see what it was after. And I know how much, how, how ugly it was to have to do. You're, you're, you have to have the gloves and if you're smart, and careful, you can do it without a mask, but you really shouldn't. Um, but, but so that's what I did this year. I wanted to see how it works, and I can't tell you how well it worked because I'm not done yet. Okay. But the, the 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 drone trapping and the summer splits kept my population. My my samples were always one or two. Good. Um. So the next one is. Uh, why different positions for the frames during drone trapping? I'm not sure what that refers to. Why? Uh, I uh, the picture showed a, a, a deep and a medium, and uh -huh. I did the deep 
uh, on a, I had a deep eight frame box several years ago that no longer exists. Um, but I, I use all mediums and I just put a frame in without, without anything in it foundation. And then, you know, next to the outside on both sides and then next to the outside on the one above. And, and that seems to work. They seem to fill those quite fast in those positions. That's where they would normally be anyway, is towards the edge of the brood nest. And, and uh, so that seems to work quite well. Let's see, next one is, when adding supers to your hives, do you add on top or below? Um, I'm lazy, I go on top. <laughs> <laughs> Have you used rhubarb leaves for treatment? Oh, for the oxalic acid, I haven't. I've heard of people who do it. Um, I don't know how, how effective it is. Um, there's oxalic acid in rhubarb leaves and, and if the bees consume the leaves, you know, they'll tear them up and carry them out. They're gonna be exposed to that, but I don't know for how long and how much, but that's, so no, I haven't. Okay. Um, so if, there's another queen question. So Colin saying that her her queen is going into her fourth year with a very healthy full hive, going into going into winter. So I've had one of them too, but not anymore. Um, if the queen survival reality is not uh, is not good anymore, why are, uh, what are we doing about it? Well, I, I think like I said before, what what. What beekeepers want are bees that are resistant to Varroa because they don't like putting poison in their hives. So the breeders have looked at that particular trait fairly rigorously. And, and I think perhaps some other things have fallen by the wayside. You measure Varroa resistance, you also have to measure temperament and production and egg laying ability and, and all of the traits, the positive traits you want for bees to survive. And, and uh, I think some of those are getting left behind. Okay, so the question about the swarming urge. And so uh, she says that uh, keepers should manage it to avoid loss and interference with the neighbors. What's your, uh, what's your solution? Well, believe it or not, if my summer split hasn't solved that urge, I'm gonna, I, 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 they'll swarm and I'll prob I, I probably, I probably catch most of them just because of the way my yard is set up, but I don't catch all of them and I can tell when I've missed, but the summer, the summer split um, pretty much takes care of that. They think they've swarmed and I've, I've taken that off from their plate and, and I've also given a break for Varroa and now I've got another colony. So it solves a lot of problems. Um, um. Does it affect the morale of the hive by continuing to remove drones? And is that natural? No, it's not. <laughs> and it probably does. Although, although that's a good question. And, and you know, how do you, how do you measure the morale of a hive? I'm not sure. Um, but I'll pull one out and, and in the height of the season, they'll fill it up in in three weeks and it'll be you know almost completely full and then towards midsummer it begins to uh, uh, wear down and by you know late summer I, I may get a frame with none in it so I, I think it I think it I'd like to think it satisfies the urge to produce 20 percent of your population of drones so maybe the morale is going up instead of down I don't know yeah. um, how do you feed back the pollen what I do is I'll trap pollen all summer and I just put it in a, you know, a sandwich bag and throw it in the freezer. I don't clean it, I don't do anything. And then when I wanna feed it, I bring it out and I let it thaw and I'll just mash it in a bowl with a little bit of sugar. Um, and that's all, just enough sugar to, to and, and, and if it's really dry, um, I'll add some water or sugar water and just enough to make a patty out of it. Um, any thoughts on using thermal treatments for Varroa? I've, I've seen that work. Um, and, and, and there's a fellow here in the States who sells a, um, a machine that does that. 
and 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 it's it's I suppose it works well and it's it, uh, you know do you call it natural I don't know making the temperature in the hive go four or five degrees higher than it than it normally would it's one of those things that I'm just I'm probably not going to do like I'm not going to wear a gas mask to <laughs> treat my hives it's just it's it, it seems to be more trouble than it's worth, but but I don't know that. Um, let's see. Is there any scientific evidence that honey enables bees to get through winter better than syrup? Is there any evidence that honey uh, ha enables bees to get through winter better than syrup? So oh, on honey, honey than syrup, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you just saw some of the things, the minerals and the enzymes and all of the things that are in honey that aren't in syrup. All sugar, all syrup is, is a carbohydrate. You know, it's going to provide energy, but it's not going to provide health. Um, and so a request to repeat your advice on insulation. I assume that's about on top. The what? Uh, uh, could you repeat your advice on insulation? Oh, on insulation? Yeah. Um, uh, well, on the hives that we use, uh, the hives that I have are, are standard Langstroth with an inner cover and a telescoping outer cover. And, and I, remove the, I remove the inner cover and the telescoping outer cover and I put on eight inches of, uh, either six or eight inches of, of styrofoam insulation that extend beyond the edge of the board. And, and then I hold the board down with the cover that I remove in a rock on top. And, and if, if your equipment is in relatively good shape, um, you'll have no leakage between the styrofoam and the box. And if your equipment is like mine and, it, and it's a little bit um, uh, ragged on, on the edge, I'll, I'll thump it a couple of times so that I make that that joint secure, so air doesn't come out of there, and 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 cold air doesn't go in, and, and you get it. so all my pieces of styrofoam have a, have a have a gash in them, probably about uh, maybe a half an inch deep, where they fit on top of the boards, and you know on top of the boards on the top of the box snugly, and then and then you can see the picture. I I I've, several ways of doing of doing this, but I insulate the sides. Um, and, and, and there is an entrance down at the bottom. Um, this one is covered by, I don't worry about entrances covered with snow. Um, I may go out there a couple times, but, but I, I, want, I want four inches of insulation on all, all four sides of that box right down to the ground, because that's what they're gonna have. There, there will be a hole down there. I will make a hole about the width of my finger. Um, but if it's done right, then the inside of the box is insulated and, and, and the bees will stay warm and you won't get condensation on the top dripping down and you will have some on the inside um, around that hole where the cool air is coming in. Okay, and then there's a question about do birds take many bees? I have no idea. <laughs> I, 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 you don't see, you know, flocks of them sitting around colonies waiting to snatch them as they fly out. Um, so I don't know, and we don't have we don't have woodpecker problems here. Um, going after the wood to get to the larva inside. So um, I, I, I know down south in Georgia. A uh, queen producer I used to know had trouble with birds uh, taking queens, virgin queens on their flights. And he had to do something to control them. But up here, not an issue. Um, do you use solid floors or open mesh floors? I have solid floors. I used to, when, when Varroa first started, uh, screen bottom boards were going to save the world. And every one of mine got a screen bottom board. And then of course, you've got to you've got to do something with them in the winter. So you put a piece of flimsy plastic in there, and that didn't seem to do well. And I went back to solid floors. Um, and in fact, I've got solid floors with insulation on the bottom, on the underside of them. Okay. So that in in winter they 
they stay warm also, warmer. Yeah. Um, any thoughts about using ultrasound for Varroa? I don't know enough to answer. <laughs> well, the only thing I've read about it was that the ultrasound heated the hive. So whether that has an impact or not, I don't know. Oh, that might be, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Um, a couple of comments um, just on the uh, foul brood. Here in, in Ireland, the, the uh, requirement to, uh, the uh, foul brood, both American and European, is a notifiable disease. So you have to uh, you know, tell the Department of Agriculture and the really realistic only treatment for American foul brood is fire. We, yeah. we, can't, we can't use antibiotics at all in the hives. So it's just That's a little smart. bit different. Yeah. What do you do for European? Um, well, if it's mild, then a, 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 a what they call a shook swarm. And if it's severe, then the same as American foul brood, fire. Oh, okay. No. We don't we don't treat European that harshly. Um, yeah. basic, uh, however, something interesting happened in the states here a couple of years ago when suddenly you couldn't get uh, oxytetracycline, you know, just over the counter. You had to get a prescription for it, and a lot of commercial beekeepers in this country had never seen European fall brood because they just routine they routinely treated every spring and every fall. And suddenly half their colonies had European fall brood and they didn't know what it was because they'd never seen it. Okay. But yeah. but on a on a generally on European we found that that feeding pretty much takes care of it. Sometimes it won't, but you know it's it's and it's the same with it's the same with um Nozema, if you can get them to eat, you can pretty much clear that up. Yeah. Yep. Um, how much ventilation do you allow your hives for winter? None. Okay. I, 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 I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it as warm as toast in that inside that hive. Okay. I don't want. I don't want warm air rising up and escaping, and and um, it should stay. It should stay right where it is. Um, uh, this is a silly question. Do your chickens' eggs taste of honey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never noticed the tasting different. <laughs> uh, uh, I do. I do the same with my my drones. But actually, there's one other thing that is becoming more popular here, and that is queen trapping. So it's the idea of putting the queen onto a a trapper in in one frame on one frame for. Uh, uh, until the, she's laid up the frame, allow the frame to get sealed and then take it out of the hive and, and do that three times in a row. So, so that way you attract all the mites into that yeah. frame. So it's, you know. that, would, uh, that should work, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so er, there are a number then of, of thank yous and everything and I, and I have to echo, echo that. Thank you very much for your time. Um, very interesting. Um, sort of raises questions about why we're doing some some of the treatments that we're doing. Maybe we shouldn't. Um, so, thank you, thank you very much, Kim. Well, you're welcome. It was a, it was a good time. I appreciate the invitation, and um, maybe we can do this again. <laughs> Perhaps. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, right. Thank bye, you. Bye, everybody. Right. Bye, bye.